<laughs> um, welcome, everybody. So it's it's uh, it's so nice to be anywhere at this point and to be in so many places. Uh, I I, as some of you know, uh, live in New York. I'm here with my colleagues, Abe and Matt. We'll introduce ourselves in a moment. Um, New York's a weird place right now, and um, certainly more more uh, so for the folks at the front lines of the health world uh, than ever. But that's also true around the country. And we're doing a whole lot of these roundtables this week. Um, we had one with K through 12 on Monday. We had one with higher ed on Friday. Uh, there's an environment one coming. There's one for churches tomorrow. And they've been fascinating. Um, but of course, the health sector has a particularly interesting uh, place in this moment. So really, really excited to be here. And very quick on housekeeping before we get into intros. We'll send the recording and the slides to you after. So don't feel like you've got to furiously scribble notes this whole time. Um, you've all been muted by my colleague, Abe, uh, who's playing the role of hockey enforcer today, uh, thankfully. It's because we have about uh, 80 people on the line, and you all have uh, dogs and babies and husbands and spouses making all sorts of noises in the background. So we'll unmute folks at different points for that. Um, there are, uh, I believe, two, uh, two different ways to communicate. Um, the first is the chat. If you're going to use the chat, just make sure to click to all attendees. Otherwise, it's just going to go to a... Um, uh, I believe it's just going to go to Abe. Um, and if not, uh, if you have questions, though, there's a separate Q&A form. And that allows us to create a running list of questions that don't get lost in all the, the interesting commentary that's happening in the chat. So just a few notes on doing this well. I'm sure that in a week, everyone is going to be even more of a Zoom pro, even if you didn't <laughs> know. Yeah. My colleague, Matt, who leads uh, a lot of our health work, is going to actually do introductions. Hey everyone, um, Patrick will be running the show today, but just wanted to kind of kick things off here. Um, we have some really incredible people lending their time uh, to share how they're navigating this crisis with the American Heart Association. We have John Hayes, Senior VP of Charitable Estate Planning, uh, Pamela Leonard, National Executive Lead for Estate Planning uh, at the American Diabetes Association, we have Susan Dissart, uh, the Plan Giving Officer, and then from Fred Hutchinson Cancer Research Center, I actually learned it's, it's mostly the free will team that abbreviates it to Fred Hutch. <laughs> <laughs> we do too, um, it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we've got Renee Kurtzos, uh, Executive Director for Planned Giving. Um, really looking forward to how this conversation unfolds. I'll be the one flagging questions, as Patrick mentioned. Uh, the best way for us to see those and make sure that you're heard by some audience participation in this. Uh, we actually don't have a Q&A form, but what you can do is in the chat window, go down to where it says probably everyone right now. You can click that drop down and find my name. It's Matthew Plax. If you send those directly to me, I'll for sure see it. You can also use the main chat, but there's a chance it might get lost. Uh, and we wanna make sure that you're heard. So uh, without further ado, pass it back to Patrick. Great. Uh, thanks so much. Each of these folks could get a five-minute introduction, uh, but we're <laughs> happy because I have so many folks who want to get some actual insights. So today we'll do, we'll, we'll have a conversation with John, Pamela, Susan, and Renee, open it up at different points to questions, to ideas in, in your own, um, but we want this to be as participatory and as, as forward-looking and action-oriented as possible. You know what let's talk about to do next. Um, these are us. Uh, you can see our faces. Uh, less touched up and glamorous mm -hmm. video. What this all look like on our very <laughs> best day? And then we've been coming back to this quote from Jerry Panas, who's a leading nonprofit consultant uh, right now. We just want to sort of kick off the conversation. Is There's always uh, something going on in the world. There's never a perfect time to raise money. There's no such time when all factors will be in our favor. And so um, what do we do now? And, and with a bias towards action. Um, so let's get into questions. Uh, first, you know, we shared a survey beforehand, so we'll, we'll reflect back some of that as well. Um, one thing we saw is that 3% of folks are actively adjust, adjusting plans to meet fundraising goals, and then the, everyone else is, is trying to figure that out right now. So everybody's changing, and it's a question of have you changed already or are you in the process? Um, so maybe I'll start this question. Um, and Pam, let's, let's start with you, if you don't mind. Um, and John, feel free to hop in to the same organization. Um, are you currently scenario planning, move back to normal uh, in six months or three months or even in 15 months? Um, how are you thinking about 
so many unknowns Ooh, that are happening. Yeah, <laughs> absolutely. So since we mainly work with seniors in uh, in plan giving, we expect their we expect our group to be the last group that will actually be open to outside visitors. So the bright side of this uh, challenge we like to see, we like to look at is that, that um, we're gonna between when the general public kind of goes back to normal um, and when our target audience goes back to normal. So we're gonna be able to pick up some key learnings from the general public going back to normal, but it also gives us where, you know, for example, we don't expect to um, have to pivot super quick to face back to face to face visits tomorrow, for say, uh, where we have to, you know, secure travel plans and we have to, you know, secure those visits. So with our target market being a little behind um, being open to, to face to face visits, we're almost on an advantage, I think, in plan giving. A really interesting insight. Um... Renee, anything that you'd want to add from your organization in terms of how you're thinking about all these changing factors? Sure. Um, I'm not really sure if we're ever going to truly go back to normal all the way. I was reading an article uh, yesterday talking about how business travel is probably going to be changed forever going forward and turn and do through Zoom um, versus in-person meetings. Um, we've certainly been doing a lot of donor visits over Zoom or, or Teams or whatever have you um, uh, in the last uh, month. Uh, almost month and a half. Even before we were told to go home on March 4th, um, we were no longer having meetings of five persons or more in a room. We were no longer allowed to interview people face to face. Um, and I think there's going to be a lot of changes as we go back to our campus with a lot of cancer patients, just to make sure that we are um, respecting those protocols going forward for the next 18 months and what that means. And, and now being more prepared and more aware of what this could be in the future. Mm -hmm. I think that's a great point about there not being, there will be, a, something will be quote unquote normal again, but it will never be uh, what we used to do. And yeah. then one interesting thing that we've seen actually, is that all we, you know, a lot of folks that, oh, my donors aren't tech savvy, this month we get tech savvy. And they're, they're great, they're, they're keeping them through Zoom and video, um, they're getting on email more, all these things that they used to, to have other options, but now people are really, generation consumers have always been much more tech savvy than their predecessors, um, but this is a big shift. Um, Susan, anything that you wanted to add from the American Diabetes Association? Well, I think the big thing for us is we rely a lot on phone calls, and we always have, um, but we're finding now that people are answering our phone calls a little more um, instead of waiting to hear if it's somebody they want to hear, or maybe it's because a lot of the political ads have ended, but um, we're still going back to the calling a lot, um, sending those personal notes. Luckily, nothing has happened to the mail system with this virus, uh, so we can still take on that. So um, kind of echoing Renee and Pam, we put the travel on hold, but we're still mm -hmm. continuing to call pe people, uh, um, reach out, write the notes. Yeah, great. Um, you know, we asked a lot of folks about how their, you know, the org their the focus of their organization in a health context for some people it directly impacted COVID, and for some people it's indirectly impacted nobody is unaffected here and 72 percent said the populations they're focused on are directly impacted uh, which is really interesting to see um, given that many of the people you work with fall into the high risk category how are you balancing messaging around things like education with continued focus on development um, john maybe we'll start with you and then um, uh, Susan and I was actually on the phone with one of your colleagues 20 minutes ago. So we'd love to hear more about what you guys are up to after John speaks. Great. Sure. So on the messaging side of things, so you know, fundamentally what we have found going into this, um, and, and everyone's kind of touched on it already, is um, it's stewardship first. I mean, it's always been that way. So some things are, are, um, are new, but some of the old things have become new again. And so stewardship counts. Um, so what we have found, what we're looking to do is when we message out to our donors, we really want to find out first and foremost, how, how are you doing? How, how, is it, how are you connecting up? How are you dealing with everything that's going on in your world? 
right now. And then we lead, we lead the conversation from that perspective. And to, I think it was Sue's point, uh, and I was shaking my head in total agreement, uh, what could have been a, a, on a face-to-face, -face, a pragmatic one-to-one -one meeting, donor meeting, where we'd have our materials and so forth, they're turning into 40, 50, you know, hour-long meetings uh, on the phone or FaceTime because they want to, they want, they just want to express themselves and they want to hear about what it is that we're doing. So when we get, when we get through all of that, they want to hear about, well, well, why did you call John? What's, what's, what's going on with you? And so we've been looking at uh, balancing that messaging specifically and foremost around stewardship, not solicitation hardly mm -hmm. at all. We think that this is absolutely the wrong time to be doing very targeted soliciting or asks like that. So, but what is interesting about that, as we message that out and balance that out, um, we're finding at the end, and I think Pam would agree with this, we've had many phone calls, where a lot of donors go, well, what are you, what are you guys doing? How can I help? Uh, what can I, what are you doing that is really impactful that I can help with? And so those gift discussions where it wasn't, didn't start out that way, circles back to that. Mm -hmm. And it's, but it's really donor led. So it's very, it's very amazing to me how the donors, one, to your point, Sue, are taking the calls. And then two, the follow up calls, because that's really what, what counts is that follow up phone call and the education that they want to see and hear about what's happening in their communities with your know, heart disease. Because heart disease was there before, it's here now. And when you look at those underlying causes, they want to know how we connect in the dots and making that impact. So we'll be, we're being very, very careful around that. So at the American Diabetes Association, we're very much um, on the same kind of line as John said, stewardship is first, checking in with the donors, making sure they're okay. And on that, we did start a new campaign, a little different. We are um, asking people for money in a way that we're uh, messaging, get help, give help. Mm. And so we're not asking give money, we're asking give help. Um, yeah. And we've got it highlighted now as a banner on our homepage. We've got some great resources around there. Um, people won't have to go through the website in 8 million places to try to find the right things. It's right there at the beginning. Um, and it's great for us as a development officer because we can send an email and put an active link to a page knowing that that page is getting updated all the time. We don't have to always update our information. But um, I'm really proud of our marketing team and the other people that we're working with, our team. Tracy Brown um, with the get help, give help um, way to get the first button with all the information you need about COVID-19 and diabetes care for your friends, for your family, for yourself. And then if you can, give help. That's a great, that's a great friend. Um, Renee, I'm going to go into the next question and then we're going to lead you off with it. Um, <laughs> we actually asked folks, and, and John spoke to this, have you suspended or meaningfully adjusted planned or major giving solicitations? 77% of folks uh, are still going to solicitation. Some of these have moved softer. All the good ones that I've seen, all of the crisis and what's happening. Um, and then 54% said, we already have alternative plans in place. 31% said, yes, but we're, we're, we're not sure what it is yet. Um, this is around events. 4% said, we expect to cancel. And then 11%, and these hopefully are events far in the future, say we expect to continue to do so. Um, Renee, you spoke a bit about this, but you know, Given that, that appeals are changing, that you're replacing face-to-face -face communication, what have you seen that's worked for you all? Well, so we have uh, been trying very hard not to truly cancel events, but just change how they're happening. So um, today is actually our second um, donor town hall that we've had since um, uh, the, the epidemic has, or pandemic has started. So um, we've been doing that for our donors. That has been very much an information um, sort of uh, atmosphere as opposed to an appeal, but we are going to start moving towards an appeal because we do, um, we are doing COVID-19 research, so we are, um, we have the ability to make a COVID-19 ask, which is a lot different um, than other institutions, so we are pushing that out there. Um, but also, even with some of our other events, we have our allied professionals, uh, used to be a luncheon, coming up for uh, all of the professional advisors that we work with. And we are just gonna make that also an online town hall. Um, we're actually excited because we see this as a really silver lining opportunity. Usually we'd get about 100, 120 people um, to an event and of course have a catering bill to go with that. Um, now now we really are trying to aim for a 250 person audience, if not more. Our town halls have been getting about 700 donors calling wow. in. Um, immediately, we pivoted as well to even just our signature line saying, you know, come here for more information on COVID-19. We pushed out articles on how 
folks with blood cancer were more susceptible at being in, at a high at, at risk group. So we really started with information, but we are starting to use these events to transition into um, how can we do some fundraising appeals? I will say, I, uh, just a shout out to MS, if anyone is on here works with MS Society, um, they had a really cool graphic I saw on Facebook yesterday, they're taking their MS walk virtual. And mm -hmm. so it was a, basically a, a, a footprint of someone's house with footprints around it, you know, creating their like rest stations and stuff like that kind of as a joke, but they are gonna be doing a virtual walk this year. And I know we're looking into doing that for our um, obliterator, our bike ride that we do every August. Yeah. Renee, I'm just going to follow up on that because I think this idea of a virtual town hall is something that a lot of people are interested in. Um, you have a more, a larger and more sophisticated uh, fundraising team than many other folks on this call might have. Um, what are a couple of, of just clear action steps on how to actually pull something like that off? Is it phone? Is it video? Oh. What have you done <laughs> already? So we'd love to hear. Yeah, so we're using the Blue Jeans platform because I think you can get 5,000 people onto that um, if you need to. Um, we're also using it for weekly town halls for our entire staff and about 2,000 people um, either call in or log in through their computers to that every week. So thankfully by the time we did the donor um, town hall, we had already tested it like three times. Uh, we have a new president um, who just joined at the very beginning of February, Fred Hutch. So he is now, of course, just like everyone else sequestered in his home and he's um, in his apartment by himself in Seattle. His wife still hadn't moved out from uh, Connecticut. So uh, he's become very adept at running these town halls, both for staff and now for donors. It's uh, one of those things you'd never think to interview for, um, but he's great and he just keeps the conversation moving. And I think people are starting to really feel like they know him just through these phone calls. It's kind of crazy. And I've been getting great responses. And then just like we can see chats on these calls, I can see the chat from my donors on the blue jeans. And sometimes I respond to their questions in real time if I can send them an article right away um, while they're waiting for their question to get answered because like, you know, 200 questions are getting submitted on town hall. So, you know, they're not going to get to all of them. Um, Pam, is there something that, that AHA is particularly proud of in this moment? Yeah, we're doing a lot of the, the same types of things, uh, you know, really pivoting quickly. Um, we have a large amount of uh, spring events. And so we're, we're switching um, a lot of those to virtual events. So virtual heart balls, virtual heart walks, virtual Go Red for Women luncheons. Uh, we have our Kids Heart Challenge that is typically done in and we've transitioned that to a campaign of uh, kick cabin fever to the curb which is still allows um, students to participate in um, you know a weekly challenge uh, where they are doing some physical activity um, but and it also allows you know parents giving them ideas of how to uh, support the heart association and stay active with their kids while they're homeschooling and gives them some additional resources we're also doing you know internally our, our town halls with um, our staff. We have several thousand staff across the country. Um, so we're able to continue doing our town, our, our town halls weekly internally, as well as um, having uh, virtual uh, society donor events in which we're pushing out um, our science-based research that's going on right now around COVID and um, all of our great, you know, current resources. So a lot of things going on. We're definitely not seeing, um, you know, anything slowing up. Mm -hmm. um, one of the good stuff. One of the interesting things that seems to be a common theme across organizations like yours that are successful in this moment versus the ones that are a little um, maybe more hesitant or panicked is whether people see it as an opportunity or a challenge. And obviously it's going to be both. But Renee, you talked about how your town hall with advisors suddenly has 100 more people and less money on catering. And Sue, you talked about how you're always doing phone calls, but now people pick up, which is a big difference. Uh, so anything else from an opportunity standpoint that, that you guys are thinking about and taking advantage of? Well, we, we're still doing the virtual events as well. We have a tour to tour, a bike race, a step out walk, um, and all of those have gone virtual. We're not saying we're canceling anything. We're just transitioning to a virtual appeal. Uh, luckily, we had our website set up for people to participate virtually already. It's just now we've got bigger in the virtual space. Uh, and we're just looking for ways, even though we won't be physically connected, the walks are such a great way to bring together a community, get a spirit. So we're looking um, very um, innovatively, I guess, to figure out how to make those um, 
virtual events still bonding and community related. So the good thing is we move around the country. We've already done one in Hawaii and San Diego. Everybody's sharing their best secrets and we're building on it. So by the time we get to November, we'll um, have this all figured out. Uh, the big thing for us on the plan giving, and um, hello to Sean Allen and Mike Jackson, my counterparts. Uh, we had a 350,000 piece mailing that was planning to drop on March 16th. So everything was done in February, dropped on the 16th. The big thing for us is then we followed up with an email to everyone that we had um, saying that it had dropped, here's the information, here's how all the different articles that we wrote now are maybe a little different because of the COVID-19 reaction. Um, but we're thinking this might be the best read newsletter ever because people have it in their house now and can't go anywhere. Yeah, that's a great point. And also, as, as you mentioned, some of the peer-to-peer -peer fundraising events, what we're seeing is that people are more in touch with their friends than they normally are. And also, they're, they're spending much more time on, face, on social media. And so you actually have an ability to, to raise more money because people just have more attention for things like that. Um, someone had a question around, can someone recommend a resource for planning a virtual event? Um, were there any things online that you guys went to, or is it all in-house expertise that you had? I mean, for, for me personally, I'll tell you, I'm not in the event side. So um, we've got great in-house people, especially our um, creative camp people and our camp people, and they're the ones that are working to get these events down um, across the ground. So um, that one, I'm not really yeah. sure. Pam, about. you looked like you were going to say something. Yeah, I was just going to say, similar to Sue, um, is that, you know, we have an amazing national, uh, you know, communications uh, MarCom team, and a lot of the resources, technology that we were already using, we're using, we're just now pushing it out to um, donors and prospects. So we, we were already connected via Zoom before this, and really just kind of taking it up a notch um, of, you know, uh, of using it for external events, so. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, one note actually is that uh, Free Will's been running these webinars every Tuesday, which has been really fun. And by popular demand, the one that is coming Tuesday is all about virtual events. So feel free <laughs> to join that as well. It's one of the biggest questions that we get. Uh, frankly, we're not experts either, but we've gone and just asked all, all around the nonprofit world. It's really fun. Um, John, is there anything that you wanted to add here, especially on the face to face communications as you deal with major donors or plan giving prospects? Um, not the folks who have already made gifts and you're stewarding, but, you know, people that you've been thinking about for a little while. You know, I was going to say, uh, Patrick, uh, uh, jumping off of uh, uh, Sue's comments, it's, you know, plan giving can be, can be seen as a weird world sometimes, right? In that when um, on the professional side of things, things are going uh, amazing because when Congress meets, things change and all these tips, we got we to gotta pivot with what's going on there. But on a personal side of things, things are like what we're experiencing now as families and as units, it's, it's, it's kind of crazy chaos right now. And that's what we found this past uh, couple of months. We have received, I, I mean, I lost count, I stopped keeping track of how many people interested in wanting to know more about gift planning wills and estate planning and my affairs in order i mean the leads are just coming off, off the, the charts it's 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 so on a on a professional side fantastic on a personal side of things going my god that's pretty weird what's going on there but there's a real hunger out there for people who wanting to know information around you know am i set um is this because this type of scenario what we're going through um, um as a lot of people have said it's it's, it's a pause and they ask those very pragmatic questions. So we get a tremendous amount of leads. We've actually seen, and I'll, I'll throw this Pam if, if I'm corrected, but I think March, this past March, we received uh, or um, secured the, more, the most gift commitments in, on the plan giving side of things than we ever have done in any one month in the history that I've been, and I've been with the organization since 2004. Uh, because you, you, again, that thing where you're just calling people up, connecting with them, um, and then the, the conversation just turns around it, and they turn it around. So while solicitation, direct solicitation is not happening, the, the gift commitments, it's happening. It's that couched kind of approach. Um, and that's why I, what I've found, and I'm learning a lot from my staff as well, because we're all talking about, you know, Zoom and FaceTime, but our demographic, they still love the phone call. 
let's not forget the phone call. They, they, they love that phone call. And what we're founding now too is we'll put down the challenges. It's not the first phone call, it's the second phone call. Because everyone, when you go through a crisis like a situation of that, that we're experiencing right now, there's a lot of us getting on the phone. But the true stewardship happens is two weeks later, you know, a month later, that fo- where you've earned the right to have that, that follow-up phone call. That's where we're seeing a really traumatic or increase in that relationship building when it comes to uh, uh, these types of, of donors. So to echo Pam's point, that's our demographic, 70 plus, 65 plus. They, uh, they really want to hear from us. And... Our thing is, are we relevant? Can we be of service in your situation with what you're going through? So we're seeing a, a very strong uptick on the gift planning side of things. That's a great point. We've actually uh, seen a lot of organizations use that same two-part mechanic. One, you check in, if they offer to help you, say, you know, I'd be happy to walk you through a couple of different options in the next round. And if you want to include plan giving there, as long as it's alongside other options, it's actually a really thoughtful conversation. Um, and if you're, um, you know, if you're newer to plan giving, we have some phone scripts that are, are appropriate for you with this part one conversation and part two. It sounds like our folks here are, are already well on their way. So that's a great option. Um, a couple ideas I wanted to share actually from the community that have put in, in terms of what folks are doing. Um, one, the nationwide walk program has gone virtual from the Huntington's disease society of America. Um, before the stores, I love this, before the stores went shut, uh, I ran out and bought every Thinking of You card from the local dollar tree. Uh, two for $1 donor business card, double-sided, taped in. This is awesome. Also, someone else had this idea a day later and found no cards in the same dollar tree, which is too bad. Um, our gala has gone virtual, and we're doing a pajama gala, which is great. Um, we'll be doing frequent video updates, inviting people to virtual town halls. I really love this idea of not trying to simply purely duplicate the thing you were already doing, but instead making the most of this new moment. Uh, lots of impact videos and emails. Um, we have the advantage of having puppies to share with can-do canines. I love this one. Um, so uh, a couple ideas. Before we hop on to our final question for our panelists, if anyone has ideas that they want to share, feel free to either uh, type them in the chat or just say me uh, in the chat and we'll unmute you so you can share it audibly. Um, and while that's happening, uh, Sue, is there any, any of the ideas that you wanted to add? I know you've shared so much with us already. Well, the big thing is still send out handwritten birthday cards. Um, mm-hmm. And Sean and Mike and I all met, and we actually were very thoughtful thinking, how do we still send out a birthday card when we don't know how people are celebrating? Or um, So we gave some thought to putting in a message about, you know, thinking of you still celebrating, if, if you need anything, let us know. Um, again, including our, including our business card, but still sending out those every touch point we can um, to connect with people. A little bit of the normalcy, still sending out hmm. birthday cards and hellos. That's great. I bet those are wildly well received. Renee, anything similar? Uh, yeah, we definitely, when uh, we were told we were going to be leaving the offices and we were not going to be, um, in, you know, welcome back on campus, basically, because, you know, again, we have patients on our campus. Um, we, the first thing we did was gather up all the paper we could in terms of cards and stuff to take home. Uh, I usually take the bus to work, so my husband had come pick me up that day, and he said it looked like our entire office had been fired, because everyone was just carrying on everything with them, because uh, at first we were told we were out till March 31st. Um, and uh, we've just been uh, keeping up on sending those out. Uh, we have had a couple of folks now for kind of paper missions, if you will, and, and sending out batches of cards to people so we can keep up on that. But yeah, we really have been trying to keep those touch points normal for folks. I've been doing more birthday phone calls as well, just because mm-hmm. it's just another excuse to connect that way. And as already has been said, um, you know, we've uh, been getting more people on the phone and people have just really appreciated that outreach because most people just aren't able to celebrate with their families right now. So um, I've also been doing, uh, when we know them, like with bone marrow transplant reunions and stuff like that, we, we try to call for those anniversaries too. So I'm calling to let them know we're thinking of them. That's incredibly sweet. Um, Kathleen uh, writes that she's been including a balloon with my birthday cards. It's great because you can, you can do that. Um, one of my good friends, uh, a consultant, she has started including a stress-relieving tea bag with, uh, with cards because it doesn't cost anything additional to ship. 
um, you know, it's probably 12 cents a teabag or 30 cents a teabag. It's really free and easy, but it creates this great moment for donors when they open that and have, you know, smell the chamomile or whatever it might be. Um, Kathleen from MDA says they have one of their ambassadors do a joke a day, uh, which is really cool. On our team, internally, what we do is somebody makes a morning video every morning, which is a little bit of personality plus what we call shout outs, which are something, you know, something that someone did well. And actually our general counsel uh, did one today where he took a Zoom background, which some of you will be familiar with, of a newsroom and dressed up in a suit and, and delivered a, you know, real time update uh, with all news graphics. And it was just amazing. So that's good. <laughs> special stuff. Um, and then Tana says, we have a community Zoom meeting every day to stay connected and each meeting with a joke of the day and throughout the day, send fun emails to uplift one another. And then Friday, happy hours, uh, which you can certainly do with your team. You can also do, you can welcome donors. And it's just, you don't have to, you know, you're all doing such important work. You don't have to talk about it all the time. And just, you know, a lot of times we'll open up the webinars we do with, or some of the meetings we have, which is just say, what's one thing that brought you joy today? And people will see that the, um, the flowers blooming outside or their kids uh, learn something new or, you know, whatever it might be. So um, Tana says they're inviting the public this way. And Jean says we're doing a virtually happy hour tomorrow as well. I'm wearing funny hats and sharing a quarantine story, which is really cool. I think people are really yearning for connection. Um, yeah, you know, Patrick, one of the things that we have found that's been very um, uh, impactful is that if you, if your charity has the opportunity to have a healthcare professional on staff, mm -hmm. who is um, highly you know, respected and so forth, bringing those folks in um, because they're very hungry for real information because there's so much information out there, right? And, um, and so we have found that once we have got Eduardo, he's our uh, chief medical officer, um, into so, and he's a great presenter too, uh, very engaging across, across the video, um, the, 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 the attendance just, just pops. So if you can get someone like that, that's a, another way of, we call them jam sessions or whatever you want to do it, um, from 50 to 100, 200 was one of them. Um, the people really, really connect with that. That's brilliant. Um, Renee, let me turn this one to you. So when we think about uh, cash, uh, stocks and IRA, plan givings, et cetera, is the weighting changing at all for you all as you think about what to pursue um, or what to suggest to donors? I think um, some of the initial calls that I had with my uh, fellow fundraisers, especially on the major gifts side of things, they started talking about like, we should lead with planned gifts because they're not gonna be able to give major gifts right now. And I said, well, um, I, I appreciate that you wanna talk about planned giving since I'm always trying to get you guys is to do that anyways. And I've kind of reminded them you can't make any assumptions. We have no idea what someone's financial position is in this market and where their head is at. Um, and that's just, you should never go into a conversation that way anyways. Um, I've had that same conversation with them around um, IRA uh, uh, QCD gifts because again, just, just because you don't have to take an RMD this year doesn't mean that's still not a good way for someone to give. But we have talked about having conversations with DAFs more and I've been doing more outreach to different uh, community foundations, um, including places like Fidelity, just to make sure that they're being invited to our donor events so that they can pass on that information. Because if you go to a lot of community foundation pages right now, they are really focused on what people can do uh, response-wise with their money. So that's just good to make sure you're um, stewarding those types of professional advisors where you can. Um, but I've definitely been sharing all the information on how many gifts we're getting in through free will and just that plan giving that the, there is an uptick. So if there is any fear about bringing up plan giving, that they, they shouldn't have that fear. Yep, absolutely. You know, what I was going to say, Patrick, one of the things that we've taken to do as well, and, and this, and if, if you can do this, because this is, it's hard data to get in your, in your system, I, I understand that. But if you can get a list of those donors who have given through their deaths in the past two or three years, man, that is a great list to be calling on. And again, just thanking the stewardship aspect, because remember, when uh, according to uh, uh, National Philanthropic Trust, there's over a hundred billion dollars sitting in that, it's already earmarked for charity. You know, just, if you think about 1% of that coming to your charity, you know, that's an amazing, and, and they've already given. So, uh, and that's one of the things that we have found, you're absolutely right, Renee, don't assume, do not assume. Have that conversation, lead off with that, and then let the conversation go, because that's a great list if you can get that, get that list to work that list as far as uh, just calling and thanking them because it's already out of the household budget, ready to give. They just want to make sure that it's. It's in had a conversation with someone at uh, one of the big DAFs late last week, I guess, 
And they said the giving rates they're seeing right now are comparable to end of year. Whereas April, oh, wow. it, normally the lowest month of the year because it's you know, sort of coming out of it. Um, and, Janu and December is the highest. And this month is equal to December of 2019, yeah. which is just extraordinary. So people are moving it out, even though those staff signs have decreased, they're still, they, they recognize that 80 cents today is worth more than a dollar Absolutely. You know, how is your organization thinking about this? Well, it's interesting. We've always balanced everything. We've got a strong plan giving department. It's not that it's the current environment. It's something we've been doing. Um, the big thing for us is we're working great as a team. It's funny that um, being all remote is making us all more connected on, on kind of an equal level. So we're getting a lot more conversations with our major gift officers, thinking about ways to really have those blended conversations so that if you're asking somebody for a, how they're doing and how things are going and if they'd be interested in supporting anything or if they've considered having a will, you know, we've got some tools and some information they can help them. So really putting it out there as being a source for helping them during this time when they might have a lot on their mind. Um, but again, recognizing and trusting that everyone on our team is doing their job is really great because those major gift officers want to help um, and they're trying, they're calling all the donor advised fund people if they can. Um, everyone knows who's in their portfolio and they can reach out that way. Um, we have a gift acceptance policy that everyone knows about. So we're not going to tell somebody we can take um, a condemned house or, or, or something that we're not going to be able to take. So uh, we're just reinforcing the message to steward our donors, listen more than you talk and um, tell them we have the tools and resources to make their wishes come true yeah. to help us. You know, one thing that, that Renee said that really resonates um, with us too is you said, you know, don't assume. Um, we have, um, we've seen a couple probably trends at this point. Um, and so we have, um, John talked about, you know, the calls that we're, that we are making and, and starting, you know, thanking stewardship first, how are you? But we're also seeing an influx of inbound calls. And in those inbound calls, it really is two groups. The people that say, I have to do my planning right now, right? You know, what can you do? You know, and I first take a breath, Let's take a breath. We can, we, you know, we can do this. So there, there's this urgent, I need to do my planning and do it right now today. And then mm -hmm. I'm also seeing an influx of individuals that, that were leads 10, yeah. 11 years ago. That is, it's unbelievable. So like, you know, we, we, we are a direct mail um, heavy plan giving effort and have been for a long time. I'm getting requests from people that requested a, a, a will planning, you know, a simple brochure 2014, 2012. And they're calling me and saying, you know, I got this. It was great information. It wasn't the time for me. I put it on my shelf. I just came across it. What do you have for me today? And so don't assume that, you know, look at those old leads too. Did mm -hmm. they ever, you know, maybe they were cooler leads or warmer leads then, but are those people still interested in, in your cause? Have they, did they actually act on that request many years ago? And it's absolutely amazing. They're pulling out this material that I'm like, oh my gosh, I, mean, I remember that. I remember when we did that. <laughs> and it's old, you know, old logos and all old pictures, but um, they, that, they put that away just and said, okay, we're going to do that one day. Today's the day. Yeah. And that's what we're seeing. And so it's, it really is uh, a lot of people that are motivated and calling in and asking us, but don't assume those old leads are dead, um, that, you know, reach out to those folks as well and just see how they are. It goes back to the, the Russell James research, and, you know, in that uh, it's a life event. Nine times out of 10, it's not, it's not your slick brochure that did it or your, your funny accent that got me on the phone. It was a life event. Well, we're all in it now. And I think, that, I think that really resonates with a lot of folks. This is the time. Now's the time. John, on our site, we've seen six times more bequests this past March than, the, than 2019 March. Uh, remember, six um, times. Um, these are people that are trying to do their estate planning. And some of that is experiments we've run and we're with more partners. But it's, it's just, it's overnight. Right. I mean, it's not the difference between the last week of February, and the last week of March is astronomical. Yeah. And it's seeing the same thing. Great. Um, yeah. And by the way, uh, Kent, who's here, mentioned that he had a conversation with someone from Fidelity Charitable who predicted a two hundred million dollars out of DAFs by the end oh. of the month going directly. to So that's that's not even total giving. Yeah. Just 
enormous and, and everyone's really stepping up here. I think you can see that across the board. Excellent. Um, well, I want to open up the floor, Matt. Maybe you have some questions uh, in hand, but just to make sure that we get through um, a bunch more of conversation from, from what people want to hear from uh, the panelists. And feel free to either direct it to someone in particular or I can help uh, do some traffic navigation there as well. Hey there, I have a question from someone who is curious now that events are, are canceled, you don't have that catering budget, <laughs> but I think uh, someone mentioned, um, there, there, someone is asking about creative ideas on uh, how to convince leadership to shift some of that to, to other strategies. <laughs> oh boy, oh boy. Uh, I know, it's gonna be a tough one, but I figured this, uh, this crew of folks. Uh, I know my name, Renee. <laughs> oh man i mean i feel like that's been the whole you know um everything i've already done my whole 20-year career and now <laughs> it's condensed even more <laughs> to trying to get money shipped to plan giving um i actually i think um just like a lot of people I, i'm just trying to make the case to keep our budget where it's at because even though yes we are losing some of those budgets on the fundraising side when you look at your whole organization and depending on the type of organization you are you're looking at other problems um that are happening um, to paying um, workers who aren't there, um, uh, who might have been paid hourly or from certain grants. Like for us, we get 75% of our money from um, the government, from NIH and NCI funding. So they're being very flexible right now in terms of uh, keeping those grants floating. But what we're trying to do is keep paying those people who are not in labs. We are, mm. just like everyone else, on very severe restrictions on who can be in what space right now. So labs are scheduled out for maybe this person can be in the lab for two hours and then they leave and someone else comes in. And so it's not very productive. Things are slowed down. And when we finally come back to campus, and we don't have mm. a comeback date yet at all, um, they, they don't even want to speculate right now um, on when they're going to let us come back. Uh, they're going to have to do all that work, but they've already been paid for it. So they are trying to find any way to, to, to save money, period. So I would say I've been using a lot of the stats from, um, from, from you guys, <laughs> from Free Will, to help to say, I appreciate that we're all going to have to cut something, which they've told us we all are. but this is not the time to cut plan giving. So I would say that I've been able to save some of our budget as opposed to increase our budget. Um, but you're right, we definitely are looking at creativity. We've already said what we're not spending this quarter, what we're not gonna be spending next quarter, just to kind of help that out. But it's just, you know, institutions are bigger than just our fundraising teams. So that's, that's harder for those folks to make. Right now, if I were to lose a staff member or want to send a new um, contract, everything has to go from through my president's office, period. Um, wow, that's interesting. Before we get to the next question, um, Matt, do you mind dropping in uh, the survey? One thing yeah. that we want to ask everyone to do is, we'll probably do this again uh, in a few weeks as things are changing so quickly. Um, love to have these guys back. We'll also, you know, maybe loop in some other folks as well. And, uh, but we'd love to know how to do it better. And I think we try to be relentlessly improving. So just let us know what we can do better, what went well, um, what else you'd like to talk about next time so we can do that as well. But um, we'll continue with any other questions that we have uh, as people are filling that out. So a lot of organizations are sending out emails on a daily basis. Rachel here wants to know if there's any ideas on how to stand out, especially since e-solicitations are for most uh, one of the few options that they have with mail houses closing? Um, I think I've seen it most successfully on the e-solicitations really in the arts world more than I've seen it on the healthcare side. And I'm just starting to see healthcare catch up. So because of the immediate needs around arts organizations um, in Seattle, just because as soon as we you know, shuttered everything, you know, obviously you're not spending money on tickets or entrance fees, you know, they had a, a huge case to put out there and they were sending out a lot of emails for those solicitations. I've seen really good matches for that. Um, you know, people putting out um, information even on, you know, what's happening, um, you know, while, while people are working from home, I think that's been really helpful. But I'm just starting to see solicitations come in from health organizations like American Cancer Society, I think, you know, just put out an email with the headline, you know, cancer doesn't stop, which is great. So I think if you're if you are trying to put out these solicitations, you have to be, you know, saying what what's happening to your organization and be really honest about how the crisis is affecting you. Because there's after a certain point, you can't just be putting out information or making sure you're checking in on people. 
you do need to solicit money, competing with other organizations that might look like they're in more need. Heck, I feel like I'm competing with, competing with small businesses for the first time in my life who are asking people to buy gift cards and stuff like that to keep them afloat. So uh, I think that you do need to put out these solicitations. I don't think that can stop. I wouldn't do it every day, but I would certainly be making that case of, of what would happen to your institution um, you know, if, if you're going to be closed for much longer or, you know, not able to, to be going into to the office. And I think that's a huge, huge part of it. Um, Pam, anything you wanted to add there? I think that in this, um, you know, in this environment, personalization cannot be, you know, taken lightly. I mean, I think that, you know, being able, if you have the um, technology to be able to say, um, you know, dear Patrick versus, you know, dear friend or, or nothing at all. So personalization is key. I also, um, being able to provide um, relevant information. So we're doing a lot, not just on what we are uh, as an organization doing around COVID, but also about, you know, healthy, you know, recipes, real life stuff, right? Like, you know, here's some healthy recipes. If, you know, your, your cabinets and pantries are getting lean, here are some exercise tips that if you're not in, in, in a community in which you can utilize trails or, or the sidewalk, here's some things you can do on the inside. Um, so I think it's about, um, I agree, you know, you have to be be real about your needs, but um, also um, be, very, you know, I don't think it's a time for super splashy um, information and pictures. I don't want to, I said to, to somebody the other day, I said, I don't want to see a, a solicitation with somebody on the beach because nobody can go to the beach right now, right? <laughs> so, um, but just be real and kind of pare down, simplify, add personalization if possible, and provide because I think solicitation through service is something that is going to really work right now. You don't have to be up in people's faces about, you know, give me all your money and, uh, you know, I, it'll, be, it'll be great. But if you are showing your relevancy, then that is an automatic, you're doing great work. How can I help? I want, you know, I want to find something that I can do um, to support the cause. Yeah. Yep. John and Sue, I'll give you the last word on this and then we can wrap up. Like, yeah, I get Oh, sorry, ahead, <laughs> okay. Well, I was going to say, you know, as I started off, it, it, it really comes down to that. Be relevant, be of service, be a partner, challenge yourselves, challenge, we're constantly challenged with that. How can we be relevant in this time? And that's why when you look at this time, it's, it's, I, I consider it, you know, you've heard this term, a black swan moment, you know, a month ago, uh, everything was Great, and then uh, and then now all of a sudden, because of what's happened, we all find ourselves in this in this situation. So we will come out of this. To your point, how we don't know when we don't know, but we were relevant then. We're relevant now. So how can you how can you communicate that about that relevancy around your mission? And it's that same old development principle, right, that we learned back in the day, and that is lead with mission, lead lead with mission, listen and be good stewards. And if you can provide that service. Uh, or partner with folks, that is what will earn you the right for that second phone call, for that second visit, when this is all, all, all played out. So really take the long view, as in plan giving, right? It's a marathon, not a sprint. We always say that. Always try and take that long view and be, a, be relevant today so you can have an impact um, in, in the future. And I'll just close um, everything everyone's saying about remember to listen and be a good steward, but I think in the healthcare field, we have an advantage in that we have experts on our staffs or on our boards that really can add some relevance and um, interesting information. And people are looking to find what the truth is and to know that you can balance your organization and position yourself as having the answers will get people to come and, and talk to you more and read your emails because they know you're going to be giving them something of value. Um, well, Sue, John, Pam, Renee, um, Matt, and Abe, thank you guys so much. I mean, I, I think this was not just excellent, but also uh, concrete, tactical, concise, uh, really nice to be in community at this moment. Um, as John mentioned, this is sort of a black swan uh, event, and I'm sure, I'm sure there will be others in our lives, um, but so unpredictable and so great to have a community like this at a moment like this. So thank you, everyone, who... Uh, who joined uh, for your attention, for your thoughtful uh, comments, for all the input even before this, and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye.